Okay. So, uh, hi everyone, and welcome back to Data Society's speaker series. Uh, today we have with us uh, Tom, who is a data scientist from the US. So, before I introduce you, Tom, uh, could you please uh, go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, Tom Ives, uh, lead pro uh, lead data scientist for UL Prospector. Um, just to keep it short, I've been doing predictive analytics for 40 plus years. There, I even dated myself. Thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> so I guess to start off, just a general question. Uh, so data scientist has been, you could say has been a boost term for like a maybe solid 10 years now, and it has certainly gained traction in, in Europe and the US. So, uh, but my, my question is, so in Ireland, it has definitely been a boss term. Has it been the same in the US? And how do you define the role? Because, you know, there has been a lot of talk around it and people don't really know what data science actually is. So like, how do you define it yourself? I, and I really, appreciate that you prefaced it myself because all the terminology within the data science and artificial intelligence realm is still in flux in my opinion. But I, I like the, to modify the common definition just a little bit. It's bringing several branches of math together along with computing power and then also meeting organizational or human needs, not just business needs, but beyond just business needs, also organizational needs and human needs. I think that's been a good definition, actually, probably an interesting way of defining it. Um, so just kind of going through your career, obviously we have seen that you did mechanical engineering kind of right up until, I suppose, your PhD level, you were doing engineering. So would you find that you use this information or any of the stuff you learned throughout your engineering um, today, or has it been a complete shift in field since um, your PhD? I love this question because it's often a point of confusion. And I remember in freshman physics lab, fitting data with least squares by hand calculation. So I wasn't doing the uh, computing sphere, uh, obviously, well, maybe with a calculator, but, um, you know, I considered even back then I was learning data science and, and I would even contend as soon as a grade school, grade school student or a uh, junior high student is learning to map equations and, and fit the equation of a line based on data, they're doing beginner level data science. Um, but Molly, your question gets a little more near and dear to me because before data, long before data science was a term, I think Jan LeCun and I were in grad school about the same time. I'm not trying to speak about him like he's a personal friend. I don't know him. That's Jeffrey Hinton's most famous student that came up with convolutional neural networks. But we were probably studying neural networks about the same time. And um, I was also beginning to study expert systems. This was in grad school to support my PhD work because I started to recognize that even though I loved uh, applying control system design theory to the problems I was trying to solve, there came a point where using traditional methods was just too complicated for the amount of return you would get. So looking at things like expert systems, looking at options like neural networks, was very attractive. But then moving forward, there were many points in my, oh, and I should answer further, Molly, a, a lot of my work was focused on predictive analytics, but using physics. And, but there's even times when you're doing physics type simulations of physical systems, and, and I mean, multi-physical systems, not just one type, where, you have to use what we call empirical modeling. Well, if the data science term had never come along, I think we would have just called it empirical modeling. That was when we would make changes in a system, collect the data and do curve fitting and find parametric ways to make that, that empirical modeling more and more valuable. But 
that's what we do in data science now. Um, what's been exciting is to see how clever humans are getting with all of the data science and artificial intelligence techniques, the machine learning techniques. Um, to me, looking at things that are beautiful and elegant like transformers and reinforced learning and, and the myriad of different types of neural networks now, that, that gets me excited to see how clever we are at even overcoming our current hardware limits with these new techniques, especially reinforced learning in that regard. Okay, yeah, that's no like it's it's a fascinating field, and as you said, there's there's so much more to go. But so just back to kind of PhD, we're just wondering, how did you decide when the right time was to do your post grad, or you know, how did you reach this decision, and how did you decide what subject you wanted to um, further your studies on? Yeah, absolutely. I remember as an undergrad doing my senior design project. Um, I had to predict the dynamics of an icing rate detector. And it was pretty simple, but realizing that I could dust off what I'd learned in differential equations and apply it to predict the way a system was going to behave. Um, and then also learning bond graphs, which is a, a graphical way to represent the differential equations of a system. That got me very excited. So after grad school, I went off to serve with the Naval Nuclear Program as a civilian because I found that very exciting. But while I was there, I, I really was longing to go back and become a better expert at predicting systems uh, using math, using computers and simulating that performance. And then it was just over time in industry that I found that the needs seemed to be shifting or, or at least where I could help my organizations more by uh, automating the collection and visualization of data into da automated dashboards and, and automated website generation for performance of systems using statistics and just good data collection. And then mentoring grad students that were doing uh, types of machine learning to predict things we were interested in at those companies. Thanks for that, uh, Tom. Uh, so I guess going more into your career now, so just a starting question. So can you tell us about the work that you currently do with uh, UL? <clears throat> I can at a high level. Um, so Prospector inside of UL is, is a great business. It's serving the world in a very good way. Um, it's two businesses, old businesses that came together um, by acquisition by UL. Um, the first business, the one that I'm primarily serving is, um, it was called IDES and they were hosting the largest and most accurate plastics database in the world. The other business uh, was named Innovadex and they were hosting a very rapidly growing and big database for paints, coatings, personal care and cosmetics. And they joined those two businesses and um, we have a SaaS software as a service that um, helps companies and creators of new products find the, the plastics, paints, coatings, personal care and cosmetics they need for uh, the products they're creating. And so my first big project for them that I'm still working on is quite challenging is to automate entry of data that arrives in PDF format, but help to speed up the entry of that data uh, into our SQL database, or at least get it ready for review by humans before it's delivered to that SQL uh, database to speed that process up. Um, okay, so my next question is actually um, about HP Enterprise. So we saw that you worked on multiple projects that received over 26 patents, printers, and 3D modeling isn't like an obvious application of data science. Could you tell us a bit about some of what you did there maybe, or a particular project that stands out to you? Yes, um, there was a business I was involved in with MIMS that was um, canceled. And uh, I could understand at the time why they cancel it. We even tried to joint venture 
with IBM to save it, but uh, it was just doomed because uh, Flash and and SSDs uh, overcame their barriers. But it was it was a fascinating project. And so I found found myself working in the laser jet part of the business, and um, I, I had a brilliant P fellow PhD friend that was working on some predictive models, but he was doing it all in Excel, and it was um, models for cartridge wear. And I said, Marcos, you got to stop this. You're killing yourself. So uh, we converted it to Python right away and it started running much faster. And that's when I started realizing, okay, it's not just running these statistic based models for printer wear. Um, I've started finding ways to validate those findings. I started finding ways to automate the running of the cases we were most interested in for prediction and then looking for ways to validate that in, in a, a follow-on test. And then later on, um, when I changed businesses with an HP, I also worked in what we call the color pipeline group. And uh, it was a fascinating group doing a myriad of different types of things that, uh, are in the greater realm of what I would call data science, like psychometrics, also um, models to deal with the way we remove noise when it comes in on scanners. Um, we had methods to help make the output consistent across our printer models for color and quality. And um, then um, if you don't mind, after that, I went on to on semiconductor and. It was also a high production environment, but that was an algorithm uh, development team for uh, automatically failing dye that should not be sold uh, for, excuse me, dye that were used in imaging systems and were still on wafers. And so that was a really, um, I mean, this in a good way, a high intense job. And there was a certain manual process we were doing um, that I just, it was eating our team's time. And I focused a lot of my spare time outside of work on trying to automate that process. And I achieved it. We still needed some speed improvements, but basically it just used a heavy amount of feature engineering, um, fitting a surface and then finding anomalies in that surface so that we could detect the, um, the the uh, defects that were in the imaging dye and make sure we didn't sell those and and get a lot of RMAs and um, then after that I moved to um, UL Prospector. Thank you for that, uh, Tom. Uh, so as you've touched there, uh, data science is applicable in nearly every single field uh, nowadays and it has a purpose in in all of them. So uh, you yourself have worked with data science in across multiple fields, not just in one. Um, so I guess, where, where do you see data science headed? Do you think every company nearly needs a data science team? Or, or is there a certain uh, you know, industry that you think uh, will benefit from data science the most? Is it OK if I flip your question a little bit? <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for giving me liberty there. Um, I mentor a lot of young people, um, even people closer to my age that want to get into data science. And the first thing that my uh, mentoring, it, it's not just me mentoring, it's more like a mentoring a family where we mentor each other and encourage each other. But as we watched the pulse, especially on LinkedIn of the moans and groans about trying to get a data science role, um, I noticed there were a few voices like ours that were standing out, uh, Michael Green, Jonathan Tesser, they're popular posters on LinkedIn, and, and th they were touching on the theme we wanted to touch on. So we did some research about some good friends on LinkedIn, and we came up with this. Don't worry about your role title. Get the best job you can where you think you can make a difference with data. Don't worry if it has data science in the title and start being a data scientist in that role. Now, I'm not saying don't do a good job on your primary role duties, but use data science to improve your performance in that role. So the emphasis is don't think, 
I have to have a data science job title to do data science and be a data scientist. That is very backwards thinking. Always be a data scientist and use it, do it everywhere you can. And then eventually people will realize, hey, you're a data scientist. In fact, I started regarding myself as a data scientist as soon as I realized, oh, that's a term now. What does it mean? Oh, I've been doing that for a while now. <laughs> and what was helpful, though, I'm glad that it's defined as a field now, Ahmed and Molly, for this reason. There's so much explosion of creativity and improvement in that realm that we now call data science. It's worthwhile to be careful what you choose to learn because you can't keep up with all of it, but you can at least know, okay, I'm going to go learn that because I need it in my current role, or I'm going to learn it in my spare time in the evenings so I can get a new role that, that does that. But if you're, if you're always careful to be a data scientist and do a, do data science, wherever you are, you will eventually have data science role titles. Now I would contend too, though, don't worry. I've seen data science jobs that were advertised without the name data science. Did that mean I was going to turn them down? In fact, at one point I even negotiated, hey, I see that you had the role title this and you're recruiting me for it, but if you hire me, could we please change it to X data scientist instead of just, you know, this other term? They said, oh, absolutely. In fact, thanks for helping us know we should title it that. So there, there's real opportunities in those two regards out there. Yeah, I actually think that's really kind of reassuring to hear that like you might end up in a role that isn't necessarily data science, but you can always swerve into it or make what you want of it if, if data science is something that you're, you know, really interested in or passionate about. But okay, this is a bit of a different kind of question and might be a bit tricky considering you're obviously just working in America, but we're just wondering a bit about kind of work culture in America. I'm not sure if you've ever worked in Europe or anywhere else, but... Is that something you think you can compare and contrast, or how do you find kind of work balance from your own personal opinion, even in the state? Yeah, I would say um, for the places I've worked, um, it's been well, let me point this out. Even though I'm clearly an older guy and I've had a long career, I'm just one data point. So I'll try to answer this question the best I can from my limited experience. In Mali, I was born and raised in Dallas, went to school in Austin and College Station, Texas. So all my education was in Texas, so not very diverse. But uh, at the same time, when you're in graduate school, you're meeting people from all over the world. So I, I almost feel like culturally or, or passionately, I'm half Indian. I have so many Indian friends from over the decades, and now I have many South American friends and European friends and MENA friends, short for Middle East, North Africa, e even Central African and South African friends. But really that's happened, the explosion of that breadth has happened because of COVID, of course. But I even have uh, um, Pacific Rim friends like China and Japan and Korea, uh, all through LinkedIn. Uh, but now that we're more virtual, I've made more friends. But we do occasionally talk about the differences in work culture is what's important to your question. And over the years, I would say that in my opinion, general work culture in the States has become a little bit kinder and gentler in some ways and a little bit harsher in others. Um, when I was young, there was still the mentality of you got a good job and you stayed at a good company for your whole career. And it it was, uh, hey, you're not in Kansas anymore, Dorothy, type shock as I was going through my career to realize you can't think that way anymore. You have to be, um, when you see your friends get laid off, you have to remember that could happen to you next. So we have to lick our finger and stick it up in the corporate wind and say, what's going to happen and do our best. But I think it's always smart now to have, um, in fact, I have a mentor. He's a little younger than me, but I just think he's so brilliant. I asked him 
to please advise me in there. And he's given me great advice. He was the one that helped me see, Tom, you've been doing data science work. Are you aware how popular that is? And I said, no, because I'm horrible at current events. So he got me straightened out. And um, But it was nice because as I drifted into that area, I really um, found that I could create my own community. I don't mean that there wasn't already a good community there. I meant I could pick and choose who I was truly listening to and hanging out with on LinkedIn. And then I realized they wanted me to have a voice too. And I was encouraged that people could be encouraged and helped by things I had to say. And, and so over time doing that, you get in touch more and more, Molly and Ahmed, with the various struggles people are feeling in different countries. And there does seem to be quite a variance from region to region and uh, country to country, but it's, it's hard to know it in depth through only conversations and not experiencing it yourself. However, I think it, there, the commonalities across regions and countries is this. When people are hiring a data scientist, they so often want someone already with a lot of experience. They do often want someone with a PhD or a master's, but it's not always the case. One of the people I wrote that article with, uh, uh, um, Abdul Ajib, um, he's a brilliant young man who was also getting a mechanical engineering degree, but switched to data science. And he got a junior data scientist role. And I think now he's, he's in a data scientist role. Um, a young woman that's like my daughter, Manpreet Budraja from India, she took a data engineering role with a really good company that has offices in India, and she's growing her skills phenomenally fast in that role, but she still has a passion for NLP and data science, and she studies a lot on the side to grow her natural language processing skills and arts. So uh, she has hopes of eventually growing into uh, a data science role, but she took it as a great first move to become a data engineer first. In fact, the two, our community has a great friend among us, Joe Rios, who calls himself a recovering data scientist. He's a, a full on hardcore data engineer because he saw how that particular function was being underserved and that the whole data science realm could do better if they had good data engineering. So he, he fo focuses on that hard now. But to circle back to a summary on this whole thing, data science <clears throat> as an official discipline is so new that it's going to take us a while to really define things more clearly and even the people offering the positions aren't thinking completely correct, in my opinion. Uh, I think the biggest mistake, and I hope this is a good point to your question, guys, is this. I wish employers would quit expecting data scientists to have domain expertise. What they need to ask is that data scientists have good personal skills, good soft skills, to work closely with domain experts, to find out what the greatest needs are and find out what data that's on hand can meet those needs. And for the great needs that, that the business or the organization does have, and they don't have the data on hand, let's start collecting that data so we can do something in the future. Because the only thing worse than dirty data to a data scientist is to be expect to do something with no data now that data scientist is turned into a data collector. Thank you very much uh, for that answer. I, I definitely agree there, uh, Tom. I think uh, a lot of, you know, data science roles don't really, uh, you know, uh, tackle the role in the right way. I think the advertisement of the role is wrong in some way. Uh, we have a question from the chat now from Nikita. So she's asking, to what extent uh, does data science affect decisions at top management level? I would say that's a huge variable. By the way, um, a good book recommendation for these realms that we've been covering is uh, my friend 
John Thompson. We became friends because I reviewed his book, but he's a super great resource and mentor to the whole data science and data analytics community. He's been managing analytics efforts for a long time. His book, Building Analytics Teams. And Nikita, I would say it depends. It depends on what company you're at. Um, I would say the most forward thinking strategic companies are taking it extremely seriously. Then there are those that are trying to throw a few dollars at it and hoping something good will come of it. Um, it's not that you should shy away from those jobs, but you're going to need to be uh, have really good <laughs> soft skills and personal skills to go talk to the leadership. Okay, I see you're investing in this, but we're going to need more. And uh, it, you know, there's two options there. There's a small team that's not big enough to solve the problems and you can be more patient. The other option is, can we please hire some more people to help us build this out? And that's when the guidance of a book like Building Analytics Teams by John Thompson is really going to help those groups. But Nikita, look uh, broad and carefully. And uh, to the listeners, I would also say this, please don't get discouraged. Keep looking for jobs close to data or in data and apply and interview a lot. And just because you had a great interview doesn't mean you're going to get an offer. Treat it as experience. Just keep going. That Getting that interview experience is key. So don't, don't be discouraged that you don't get an offer. You're competing with a lot of good people. Thanks, Tom. I feel like that was really sound advice that I'm sure is relevant to all of us and no matter what field, regardless of whether you're in data science or not. But yeah, another question then, we're generally speaking back to your own career, is kind of, I'm sure you learn on the go as you know you start new projects or new jobs, new companies, but has there been a particular way that you've kind of managed to keep your technical skills up to date do you take courses? Is it something you kind of pick up in industry or kind of how do you approach, yeah, staying up to date with obviously the ever-changing industry? Oh, that, that's an excellent question. And um, in my blog, and I should say our blog now because I have multiple authors now, and we're still young, still growing, but it's integratedmlai.com. And um, there's some blog posts there that answer your question, Molly, I'm going to still go over it. But one is um, your personalized data science learning plan. The other is cycles of becoming a great data scientist. And I, I point out in there, and I'm developing this further in my Saturday series uh, on LinkedIn, how do we grow? Because as we know, if you want to be a good career data scientist, you're going to have perpetual learning as part of your plan. And um, I'm a big proponent of master understanding the concepts. Don't worry about memorizing the detailed math because even if you memorize it, you're likely to forget it. But if you remember the concepts, then reviewing the detailed math will go quickly. And after you've mastered the concepts of the basics like linear regression, logistic regression, basic neural networks and how they're built from those previous two decision trees, random forest boost methods and how all of those relate, Bayesian methods, support vector machines. I would maybe not support vector machines. They're a little more complicated. But I would say if you understand conceptually what those do and how they apply and you get good at developing your code in your primary language to explore different machine learning algorithms, if you master those basics understanding-wise, then when you go and learn something more complicated, like reinforced learning or transformers or what have you, it will come a lot easier because you mastered the basics. You built that conceptual foundation for your your knowledge growth. And then I hope everyone realizes the more you understand the theory of something, the easier it is to apply correctly, even if it's available in one of these great libraries like 
TensorFlow and PyTorch, please do not assume that, oh, I, you know, I've got TensorFlow and PyTorch. I just need to be good at those. You will burn and fail eventually if that's all you're relying on. And then a lot of data science projects are so unique and creative that those basics you learn, you won't necessarily be using them directly, but you will always use them indirectly because those same principles are still involved and they will help you build this amazing big machine, <laughs> math machine, that's made up of a lot of smaller math machines. And so to circle around to all of this, Molly, which was an excellent question, if you keep mastering the concepts and keep allotting time, not just to learn new things, but to review old things, you'll do well. But don't be patient and gentle with yourself. If you think of all the intellectual greats that came before us that made what we're doing possible now, they didn't come up with it you know, in a, a month or two. And so if it takes you a month or two or even six months to master, like let's say you decide I'm gonna derive neural network, a neural network and its back propagation from scratch. If that takes you six months to figure that out, be happy, be proud of yourself. <laughs> it, it did not, Jeffrey Hinton didn't figure out back propagation in a month or even a half a month. Uh, excuse me, a half a year. I, I don't remember the exact time frame, but I think it took him a while. The guy that developed support vector machine math, who's still alive, like Jeffrey, he didn't figure it out, you know, in a month. It was over. Oh, let me think about this. Okay, let's go have coffee. Let's let's take a mental break and come back to it. So again, master concepts, be patient and gentle with yourself. Go deep every once in a while to really understand how to develop something from scratch without thinking you, you know, don't, don't always allow yourself to use NumPy and SciPy. I don't mean that in production or in your, your applications use those, but when you want to go deeper so you can master new topics quicker, try to do it without the libraries. Thank you very much, uh, Tom, for the advice. Uh, I guess a final question from me would be, uh, what, uh, if you know, uh, what advice would you give to a younger Tom or maybe current undergraduate students who are embarking on a data science career? What's you know the one main piece of advice uh, that you would give them? So a lot of what I. Uh, share with my mentees a lot of what I share on these shows. The reason I can speak to it so seemingly expert like is because I've made every dumb, bad mistake in the book. And uh, I appreciate John Thompson so much because he really opens his kimono in his book, sharing things he learned the hard way. And then if you get him in a private call, he'll share even more. Um, what those people that are sharing the kind of things I'm sharing with you, a lot of it's come from our own hard lessons. I would say there was a time in my career where I let my self-learning get behind and I had to catch up. Luckily, because of my emphasis on conceptual knowledge, unbeknownst to me, I, I wanted to master the concepts just because I loved understanding them. And I, I couldn't have even articulated in the past why I felt that was so powerful. Now I can articulate it. But try to learn hard lessons from others' mistakes. That's true wisdom. I, I haven't always had that much wisdom, I confess. But at least learn from your own mistakes and do not neglect growing in soft skills, in personal skills. And, a, you know, a balanced life is a myth, but trying to go around and rebalance everything, that's more reasonable. So have a have a personalized learning plan and understand your first version of that's going to stink. And that's okay. It was the planning that was valuable, the learning to come up with the plan. Then keep revising the plan and keep adding things to it over time. Keep uh, crossing things off of it or not necessarily crossing off, but say, this goes in the review pile now. And but understand, it's not linear. It's not, okay, I learned that, I learned that, I learned that. It's, oh, this first thing I learned, there's different levels of expertise at that. Can I use a module to implement that? Okay, I can do that. 
can I do it with only NumPy now and not use the library module? Okay, great. Can I do it even without NumPy? Like, can I cre recreate NumPy routines? Um, can I teach it to someone else? And they go, thank you. That Your explanation really helped me. When you can explain something back at that level, it really cements it in your own mind. And it's a blessing to have helped someone. And um, I'd say the final most important advice is what we're doing now with integrated mentoring. Um, anyone can reach out to me on LinkedIn and ask to be part of that. But we're a family that grows more together. We have a spirit of we don't want to be better than anyone else in our group or out there in the public. Once we learn something, we want to share it with others. We want to help them master it because it will only help us understand it better too. But even beyond that, it's a blessing to help the whole community. And when you are climbing in your knowledge that way, like you're climbing a knowledge mountain together, it is less lonely and you grow faster and you grow more healthy by having a more together spirit. So if you don't, if you're not part of a community, try to join one you like. And um, if there's not one you like, try to start one, but always be open to how you can improve. I think that's, that's it in summary. So I think for me anyway, that's all the questions I had. You've actually covered more than I know the questions. We've already covered them. We've been speaking so coherently. Um, yeah, you've all really good advice. Um, definitely something we can all take on board with us. And it's going to be great things on LinkedIn. So everyone should keep that in mind um, if we want to join a community, as you mentioned. But yeah, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule and for coming on here. We really appreciate it. Well, I'm much. really... I'm Thank super glad to hear. And, and yeah, I'll, you mentioned your blog and I'll, I'll put your blog on your LinkedIn. We'll try to share them uh, on our social media for all the other students to, to have a look at them. So yeah, Tom, thank you very much uh, for coming. And yeah, for the students, please have a look at our social media to be up to date with our events. And see you soon. Bye-bye.